good evening and welcome to the Interfaith Alliance Community Engagement Conversations. I'd like to present you uh, Dr. Noel Jacobs, our president. Good evening, everyone. I am delighted to start this first interfaith community conversation that we have. Our goal is to have less formal programs for you that can be more frequent throughout the year. And I am really excited about this first conversation that we get to have tonight. The goal for tonight is for you to listen to a conversation and speak into that conversation through your own presence on Facebook. If you are able to comment and put a question in your comment, after Rabbi Abby and Reverend Cherie get a chance to speak, um, towards the end of the program, we are hoping to have time for you all to bring in your own questions. I will moderate those. I am not gonna moderate the conversation itself, but I will moderate the questions so that we have a chance to learn a little bit more about your own ideas um, about the work that Black Lives Matter and Interfaith Alliance do as we have this interfaith conversation together. I'm going to introduce Rabbi Jacobson first. Um, she was born on a cattle ranch in central Florida outside the small town of Davenport. At the last census, this was still a very small town with 1,200 people and more cattle than people in the town. She went to George Washington University, graduated with a bachelor's degree in international relations with a concentration in Middle Eastern studies in 2002. After leaving the East Coast, she got a passport and moved to Jerusalem to attend the conservative yeshiva for two years. A yeshiva is a traditional non-degree Jewish learning center, and Rabbi Jacobson learned Jewish texts there for the pure love of Jewish learning. She received her rabbinic ordination along with a master's degree in Hebrew letters from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in New York City in 2009, and she's been with us um, in Oklahoma City at Emmanuel Synagogue as rabbi since 2009. She shortly thereafter joined the Interfaith Alliance, and she served as president of our organization from 2016 to 2020. So welcome Rabbi Dickerson, and I'm so thankful that you're a part of this conversation tonight. Reverend Dickerson is a native of Oklahoma, like I am, deeply rooted in her community. She's an activist, organizer, a clergy member, a truth teller, profoundly committed to freeing humanity from oppression and elevating society to its most optimal level. She's the mother of two amazing children, a mentor to dynamic young movement leaders, and an extension of her own village of powerful women mentors and activist icons. She sat under the direct tutelage of Dr. Maya Angelou and the legendary Clara Looper from right here in Oklahoma City who helped develop her spirit of altruism, community service, grassroots organizing, advocacy, and creative multitasking. She has served in multiple civil rights and social activism organizations across the country, including being a member, a longtime member of Oklahoma City's MLK Coalition, Pride, the Diversity Center of Oklahoma, the National Association of Black Social Workers, the Individual Artists of Oklahoma as a published poet um, who has traveled abroad, abroad to perform several of her original works. She's also executive officer of the Oklahoma Democratic Party and in the Oklahoma Call for Reproductive Justice. Most importantly, I would say the Women's March of Oklahoma and the Women's March movement nationally, as well as Black Lives Matter, Oklahoma City chapter founder, executive director. Welcome to both of you tonight. Um, there's nothing else I can say of introduction that lets the community know who you are. Aside from my personal stories of working with you both, laughing heartily with you both, and being very thankful that you're in Oklahoma City doing the good work that you do. I'm now just going to turn the conversation over to you as we talk about this intersection of interfaith communities, Black lives, and social justice in Oklahoma City. Thank you so much, Noel. Reverend Dickerson, thank you very much for being with us. Um, I have often told my congregation that if you feel old and tired, you need to read about Abraham, Sarah, and Moses because you don't have a right to complain. I often think about myself as a clergy member. If I ever feel tired or like I just don't have it in me to help one more person, I think of you because I cannot think of a person in your life that you have come across that you have not reached out to help. Um, and so uh, not just thank you for being here with us, but um, thank you for being you. You're amazing. Well, I am very humbled and I am certainly in good company 
um, especially with yourself, Rabbi, and with uh, Dr. Jacobs. You two are part of those who inspire me, um, who encourage me, and I am glad to call my friends. That is so kind of you. Um, I feel like it is so, um, I feel like it's almost reductivist to say, you know, um, in your role as, because, um, I, you wear so many hats and play so many different roles. Um, I would like to know what, um, when I ask someone where their heart lies and they tell me I have one cause or I do this one thing or I take care of this one old neighbor who lives across the street um, and you have seemed to have heart for so many things, um, how do you get into each of the causes? How do you get into the, the the formal running of so many things and still have room and heart for more? Um, I get into them probably because of my inability to say no, honestly. Um, <laughs> and um, from watching such great matriarchs in my life um, and having such um, men of valor as well that that loved people, that loved humanity, um, and taught me that that was the core. And part of uh, loving is, is starting at the very basic um, and primary mission of giving of yourself um, and trying to be um, part of the betterment of, of all. And so I'm just kind of, I'm doing what my mom and, and my mala taught me to do. That's um, beautiful, powerful, humbling, and uh, my to-do list just got bigger. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, I would love it if you don't mind um, if we could jump into your Black Lives Matter work, um, because I know that that is uh, something that you brought to our community as founder, um, and you're continuing to um, lead uh, in your official capacity as executive director. Um, I also know that a lot of light was shed into um, the Black community and the work of many Black organizations, including Black Lives Matter, um, following the murder of George Floyd, a blessed memory, um, and uh, as just one of many particular examples that just happened to catch fire. Um, how are things going for Black Lives Matter, now that we have had so many, um, so many, many months of distance from the last igniting event of the beginnings of the protests, how are things going for the organization? Um, well, the work never stops. Um, being um, an organization that is centered around um, mutual aid community uh, community power and empowerment, um, as well as one of our main missions is to increase Black joy. Um, and that's something that I feel like we haven't gotten to focus on enough um, because we are constantly dealing with very traumatic um, and dismal situations to where we're having to continue to advocate um, and literally raise our voices against the systems of white supremacy, the systems of racism, um, standing in, in allyship or solidarity um, with other communities of color. Um, we don't want um, marginalized people of color, poor people to continue to have to exist within these systems of oppression. So it really hasn't slowed down. Um, and would it be nice sometimes to have moments of respite? Yes, but as long as there is a need, as long as the call for um, so many of us, um, there are, there, there's such a, a wide um, and vast um, army, so to speak, of those that are part of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and those of us that are um, part of the organizing team and the leadership team with BLM OKC, 
um, we are very humbled. Um, and it is a privilege to be able um, to serve in that capacity. Um, and we're all just trying to be community. That's kind of our motto, being community. Um, and so hopefully being community will look a lot different. Um, we'll be able to smile a lot more. Um, we will be successful in dismantling these systems um, and we will be able to really just uplift and enjoy um, the fruits of our labor as well as um, being able to love on one another um, without the tensions. Please God. Amen. <laughs> um, I wonder if um, in reflecting on, you know, my own walk as a woman in not a traditionally feminine profession um, and uh, with recent interest in women's issues from Me Too and, um, and the murder of Breonna Taylor and uh, trans women and the, the sort of focus on more, uh, you know, women's issues and the women's marches, of course, um, and thank you for that. <laughs> um, I feel like sometimes the burden of the teaching when someone comes and says, okay, well, how can I be a better ally to women or how can I be a better ally to this cause? Feels like, well, I'm suffering from it. So it's my job to teach you. And if I don't teach you, are you not gonna do anything about it? <laughs> if I'm having a bad day or I have something else to do or I have dinner to get on the table, is this not gonna happen? Um, I would love to hear um, your reflections on that from any and all of the multiple communities and um, identities that you, that you embody. Um, it wouldn't be a surprise to those who know me, um, but I'm very consistent in um, the ideology and methodology of, it is not the responsibility or obligation of, of black people, brown people, marginalized folks um, to teach the vast community um, how to be um, a better ally. And because that's literally, you're asking me how for you to be a better person and how to, how to do being community or participating in humanity correctly. Um, I've seen far too many um, actions or behaviors to where I'm of the mind that you cannot teach humanity, not that we should ever have to, um, but um, you are upholding the system of white supremacy. Um, unintentional racism is still racism um, and it is inappropriate. Um, and it, it also generally creates a burden um, that people who are already trying to survive and exist in a world that is very constrictive, um, that our, our white allies, um, I wish they would understand that more. It is not our job to teach you um, how to treat us. Um, and if you really want to be an ally um, or, and I'm looking for accomplices, I need people who are gonna be in the trenches with us doing this work, um, then you need to be prepared. Um, and it, I wish it was instinctive that they know that access to the interwebs, um, Google and all of these things, um, there's a lot of information that if you really wanna know, mm -hmm. you can go um, and seek it. And if there's something that you need clarification, of that's a lot different of saying, hey, I've, I've done this and I'm, I'm just unsure about this aspect. Mm -hmm. um, because black people, I'll, I'll speak from that um, context, we don't expect perfection because that's highly overrated. Um, but we are just literally um, asking for authenticity and genuine desire um, to be anti-racist, mm -hmm. to be um, anti-homophobic, to be anti-transphobic, uh, all of these things. And so we're hoping that if you will do your own research, my grandmother always used to tell me, you know, if you want to learn something, if you want to commit it to memory, to write it down, mm 
And it worked for me. And so use very basic principles of your own personal learning style um, and your lived experiences. A lot of times when we see something and we begin to question it, that's because that is our conscious telling us that um, that doesn't fit in this particular setting. Mm -hmm. So I always say, um, trust yourself, but do the work yourself as well. I, I appreciate that. I know that after George Floyd was murdered, um, I sent a bunch of emails and made a bunch of phone calls um, to friends of mine just to say, hey, I'm thinking about you. And I remember it wasn't until later of listening to enough podcasts and reading enough books that I, that I started to hear like the email I got back was tinged with something else of, you know, of, 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 of tinged with gently moving me away from asking them what to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I hadn't understood that at the time and tried to, you know, call back right back and say, I don't want anything from you. I don't want you to teach you, uh, teach me anything. I just love you. And I, you know, that is not something I meant to trigger. I wasn't expecting it. Um, and I know that um, sometimes when I say, how can I help? What I actually mean is, excuse me if I'm an idiot, um, that I've become sensitized to a bunch of things that I'm doing that are wrong or that I'm not doing that could be right. And um, I don't want a lecture. I know sometimes when I say, how can I help? What I, what I should be saying is, if I have done something to you that is wrong, please tell me and please know that I will love you more for it and for the opportunity to make it right. You know, my religious tradition really values, um, we refer to repentance as return. The assumption that people are supposed to act correctly and when they don't, they apologize for it and then they go back to doing the right thing. Well, if I haven't, if I've been not doing the right thing, I want a way to, to say, tell me that. And I know I have not been great about using that language. Um, and I'm uh, uh, sensitive to all the things I don't know, all the things that I'm doing wrong, all the things that are that are unhelpful, that are actively hurtful, and the opportunities that I have had. Um, so I I uh, appreciate your reflection of it's not an individual's responsibility to explain the ins and outs of everything. And it is our responsibility to go look it up and educate ourselves. Um, I, I will say this, um, Rabbi Jacobson, I've had someone, uh, one of my white friends who said, this is really tough. I can only imagine what a lot of my black friends um, are dealing with and I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I love you. I don't know if that is enough. Um, and I was able to say, and, and that's an honest answer. Mm -hmm. And it was perfect because it was, it was real. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is tough. It is painful. Um, being in ministry myself, I'm trying to figure out how to, to navigate right now to be able to walk in my, in my purpose and my calling, um, while also dealing with the fact that as a black, queer, indigenous, um, non-binary black or black film, how to actually process this myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm terrible at, at self-care and boundaries because, um, I was always taught by my mentors and my yayas and my, my mothers, especially black women, that we're supposed to be the ones that are literally holding everyone up while we're holding things down. Um, and that's why I trust black women. And I, I stand up and I stand with, and I, and I say that black women deserve to be protected. Um, but part of that protection at that time was my friend saying, I don't know what to say, 
So I don't want to say anything that causes more trauma. Um, and then one went a little bit further and say, do you need a space to where you and those, your other black friends or your family can just be um, and not have to deal with the outside triggers? Do you need a black space? and offered literally um, their cabin for us to go and kind of debrief just to process and, and basic. So if you want to take a nap, if you want to this, and that was amazing. Um, that's also allyship. That is also um, being an accomplice. And that is certainly um, loving uh, the truest uh, form of love. Um, is understanding um, how to meet the needs and doing so with absolutely no expectation um, except being able to, to minister to someone else. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you had that. Um, I, you have mentioned your ministry and your path as, um, as clergy and as a religious person. Um, I know that I, I feel you do all of these things and walk all of these paths um, with an inner strength, but I wondered if you would mind sharing a little bit of your personal religious journey or where you are just, um, I'd hate to be the Interfaith Alliance and not talk about faith at least once, <laughs> um, you know, just if, if that would be not too personal um, just with oh, um, your path so or your work or anything. I live my life very openly um, and, and I do so with understanding that others that I've seen that have been courageous enough to do that, um, it helped me. And so I kind of want to do the same. I think that's the responsibility um, of leadership as well. Um, I am a third generation PK or pastor's kid. And so, um, and my mother and my grandmother we're also evangelists. Um, and so ministry is something that was just very natural to me. I didn't know life outside um, of that, um, especially after I was, um, I was a foster care ch child um, and I was part of that system um, until about eight or nine. And then I was adopted by an amazing family, um, but also found out that um, my biological or my birth mom was also a great woman of faith. Um, and, and my father was someone who just nurtured um, his family and those that he loved, his community. Um, and so I, I try to practice that. Um, I am, um, I do identify or I am part of the Christian faith. Um, I serve in ministry. Um, at one of the Disciples of Christ or DOC churches here, East 6th Street Christian Church. Um, and um, so that means that I'm very lucky to have um, a boss and sit under the tutelage of one of my dearest friends, um, brothers in the ministry and someone who um, knows me well enough to know um, that it is okay and that I take instruction and constructive criticism well. Um, and that is Reverend Jesse Jackson, who will call me on my crap or say, just rein it in a little bit, um, especially when we're in this forum, um, but also is one of my uh, closest confidants um, and a social justice uh, warrior and racial equity um, advocate um, that's where I aspire to get to where he is. And so... But I think doing liberation work and work towards freedom, that's part of the Christian faith. Um, and within the Interfaith Alliance, many of the different faith systems, um, if we just really look at it, they all center around doing work that brings liberation mm -hmm. and authenticity um, to the entire communities or believers of that faith. Um, I think if we re remember that more, um, we'd be on the same page um, and we would be able to 
unite and accomplish um, some of the, the core values um, and missions that a lot of our different faith systems were created upon. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. May it be so. <laughs> I am. Um... I am doing a lot of uh, experimental cooking and have been for this past year, as I know some people are. Um, no sourdough bread, but uh, <laughs> plenty of other things. And with my kids, I'm in a position of, you know, just because you think it doesn't mean it's appropriate to say. So you take one bite, this is gross, um, versus, you know, thank you for preparing this meal or you know now is the time i would like feedback on the food or may i have something different um i wonder whether occasionally i get i love jews in walmart uh you know as, especially walmart and especially when i'm late because i love jews or i love hebrews can i hug you less so during covid for which i am grateful um, and I know that is an awkward thing. I also know that I am sometimes stuffed so full of my own wokeness and I know all sorts of things now. And, you know, I'm just, I'm vibrating to say things that I think are gonna be stupid and that I think are gonna be triggering and that I think are gonna be hurtful and that I think are gonna be above all weird. Um, <laughs> whether it's um, that I've picked up slang because I'm listening to particular radio stations or podcasts or because I'm so full of wanting to say, I'm sorry that anybody's ever tried to touch your hair uh, or whatever it is that I'm full of. Um, do you have any um, stories, whether serious or lighthearted? Um, does that happen? Are there people who come up so full of, of genuine, honest kind of goofy love that, uh, it comes out um so i have a few corn balls in my life i am quirky and probably eccentric and um many of my children and my bonus children think that i am really weird um and so but i do not think that that gives people the permission to push their micro or macro aggressions on any person. Um, sometimes um, you, you may feel awkward. Um, I have felt inept and um, I am a person who loves learning and I wanna get to know uh, the people that I interact with. Um, but I also, um, and very intentional and deliberate um, in trying to be knowledgeable or educated about what is and is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that there are some, some factions that take their feelings of entitlement or privilege um, much too far um, and it lowers their filter. Um, and that's, that's very heavy um, and it gets very bothersome to always have to kind of point those things out um, because in 2021, I should not tell you that it is not okay to come and touch anyone um, of their person, their hair without consent. Um, if that's something that you wouldn't want done to you, don't do it to someone else. Um, stop fetishizing um, women of color. Stop thinking of, of us as some exotic creature. Um, stop um, giving in to stereotypes um, and upholding biases. So challenge your own bias. Um, learn what's inappropriate. Um, be ready to call, acknowledge when you have your bias. Um, and if you make a mistake, acknowledge that too. I'm sorry, that was that was wrong. I apologize. Um, can we start again?
Yeah. I won't do that again. Um, and be willing to accept when someone says that's outside of my parameter of comfort. Mm -hmm. um, and they ask you to not do that. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's that is part of the learning experience and lived experiences, but I mean, don't be a bonehead. If we could bottle that and spray it on some people, I would <laughs> love that. It would be so healthy and nourishing for people. I, I, I know this makes me an old lady and I'm good with that. I really love podcasts. And the reason I love podcasts is because it allows me to be an observer in a space that's not mine. And I am so steeped in my own spaces that I will never, ever have the permission to be in a space. Or even if I have permission, I'll change it by being there. And now I get to be a fly on the wall in other people's spaces and hear their stories in a genuine way, in a way that would be communicated in a safe space of people with similar experiences. And I have really valued that. Um, I think it, I, I hope it's made me a better person and that I'm not just doing it for entertainment, but it has been so amazing. I really, as a religious person, I love watching other people be religious. Um, in Jerusalem, I, there were several times where I sat in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and watched people be religious like watch people have that encounter or sit at the Western wall and watch people have that encounter for the first time. Um, I, I find it amazing. Um, it's transformative. It is a transformative experience. So um, I'm a people watcher too. It's such a, a privilege. I feel, I know it's a podcast and I know it's, you know, a little something, but it's the, to me, it's a privilege to be in those spaces and to be welcomed in without changing the character of what's going on. Um, uh, is, <laughs> speaking of clumsy segues, <laughs> I wonder <laughs> if you would mind, can I have some of that? Don't be a bonehead, I need it a little. Um, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about, um, about the role of allyship from someone who is in a majority position of power and in terms of how I am, I have felt it in ways that I am a minority and I have seen it in ways that I am a majority as well, um, that members of a majority culture can bring a lot of assumptions and disruption into attempting to do allyship, whether by taking over or by changing the character of the space or the assumptions or whatever. I wonder if you could reflect a little on that experiences you've had or things you've seen that have been where that's been an issue? On a personal standpoint, um, Abby, one of the things that I experience most is, um, and this is with inside, um, I'll speak specifically to within the systems of faith. I deal with misogynoir. Um, I deal with um, racism and the patriarchal systems. Um, and they, it seems like they treat the intersections that I have like they're comorbidities. <laughs> and they act like they know, um, they wanna tell me how to be me better. Mm -hmm. They wanna put me in a box. Several um, times like. <laughs> and that's never, um, that's never going to fare well with me. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I advocate for so many different groups. Um, but I know what it's like to feel marginalized. Um, I know what a struggle it is to want to feel accepted and to, to be accepted. Um, and I'm a person who has a lot of trust issues because of my past experiences and trauma. And even at this juncture in my life, I'm still learning how to work beyond those. Um, but when the fragility or the entitlement of, of whiteness and white men, especially within 
those places of power, um, especially within um, systems of faith, religious sectors. Um, it bugs me because I'm like, why can't you see um, that I have the same credentialing? Um, sometimes more, and that doesn't really matter. It's, it's not about a caste or class system, um, but it's almost like they automatically assume that I am lesser than, um, and they expect me to be subservient um, kind of like what I feel like many of the um, people who enslaved people 400 years ago um, looked upon those um, persons that they literally had abducted, um, those that they had stolen land from, those that they had um, tried to erase their, their culture and their heritage um, and to dismantle um, and so the colonizers. So we have a colonizer uh, mentality even within systems of faith. And I deal with that every day. Um, and they also act like I cannot be um, a, a person who is clergy as well as someone who is an activist, an organizer um, that, I, that I probably am unlearned, they, they, they pretend that all of those things cannot collaborate. Um, and yet when I do um, do a presentation or give a speech, um, they like to um, acknowledge or give me an added girl and tell me that I am so well-spoken. Mm -hmm. um, and I am clergy. But I curse a little. I know that's gonna be surprising to some. Um, I have a t-shirt that says, I don't believe that um, one of the first accounts or documented um, lynchings that we saw was of Jesus the Christ. And we know that he was um, a man who was living in um, Africa. I do not believe that you, crucified this person who was a black man and he didn't say something. You just don't, ha we just haven't had um, Aramaic um, and Hebrew um, profanities translated. Um, so um, I say that a lot of times um, I am going to learn those words um, so that I can edify the sayings of Christ. But when, when, when we come up against that, um, and also come up against the system to where they're trying to hold the power. They don't want collective power. Um, they don't want to acknowledge that other people were called into service um, and they want to direct or they want to create the narrative for someone else's um, ministry. That just bugs me. And I say something much stronger and much more curt than don't be a bonehead. <laughs> it's like, don't be the ass that Jesus rode upon <laughs> during, you know, Palm Sunday, please. Because even he sent that ass away. <laughs> Hallelujah, amen. Yeah, uh, I, I wish I did not have similar experiences, but I, uh, in certain ways, can relate. I, uh, the, I don't believe in women rabbis. That's okay. I'm standing right here. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You are phenomenal. I have other uh, women friends who are part of different faiths, um, but I have three women who are rabbis that I hold very dear. Um, the one of them also, uh, another one being here in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, Rabbi Barrett Harris, who I know deals with things. Um, and one of my favorite heretics, um, Pastor Lori, Dr. Lori Walkie, um, when I have seen times where they have um, disenfranchised 
this amazing being mm -hmm. um, who sometimes I'm like, man, if I could just, if I could just, I, I have quoted many of her prayers to people. Um, they didn't know that I was oh. also adding, you know, smite thee. Um, but, um, <laughs> you know, she had to say that, you know, hey, when they, they, they try to belittle or demean and they'll say, you know, honey, um, are you here to take the notes? She said, um, her response was, and it was perfect, is I am always taking notes. Um, and so that's something that we always have to do, but a lot of times we're taking notes so we know um, who not to bring into the fold mm -hmm. because they are adversarial um, or literally, um, contradictory mm -hmm. to ministry and to the movement um, and to revolutionary ministry. Uh, Dr. Jacobs, do we have any questions on Facebook we should be addressing? We do. Um, th there is a question about quality of life that I'm going to save closer to the end. But uh, from a member of our interfaith community, we are right now looking at white supremacy but we are also seeing some conflicts between people of color, which seems to be increasing during the pandemic. How can we tackle, how do we tackle both at the same time? Are they asking, are they talking about, I wanna make sure that I'm understanding, um, are they talking about maybe schisms between different communities of color? Or they're saying outside of just black communities that we also are seeing um, other forms of hate or oppression towards other communities of color. The question seems to indicate that it is conflicts that are between people of color from different groups. Um, so not necessarily oppression by the white majority on other people of color, but conflicts between people of color groups. Oh, you mean that there are other people who don't always get along? Imagine that. Um, and I'm not being flippant, but um, there are, there. that's just real life. Um, there are some cultures um, and there are people, um, we knew that there was competitive um, actions uh, amongst indigenous folk. Um, everyone, the, and, and communities of color, um, whether they be different or within the same, we are not a monolith. Um, and so our, our identities, our ideologies, our politics, um, they are not the same. Um, anyone that has a family, um, that has siblings or cousins or the aunties, or the uncles know that if once there's going to be some type of tension or spirited discussion, once all of you come together because everyone does not um, view, um, interpret, um, or present life um, in a similar uh, state from a similar um, stance. Um, and also our lived experience is what most people stand on um, and how they live. It's how they narrate or navigate through their lives. Um, and so since everyone's um, experience is not the same, you're going to have that. Now, if white people are looking at people, uh, communities of color and saying, oh, well, you see, they're not all getting along. Um, and so why are they uh, worrying about um, why we're not getting it right, um, my message will probably, I think you need to mind your business. Um, and also uh, from a spiritual standpoint, you know, it says, it talks about, you know, trying to talk about a splinter in someone else's life while you have this massive rod or log in your own eye. And so um, before I digress, I, I, I'll pull back. But if you are observing um, people of different cultures um, and the only thing um, that you are, that is notable 
is that you see disagreements, um, you are missing out on the beauty of the sacredness of life and community um, and missing out on the opportunity to expand um, your understanding, your relationships with people who are not like yourselves. If I could add a bit to that, maybe um, that also turns the conversation a bit. Between communities of color who are disparately affected by the impact of white supremacy on themselves, how can we help them resolve conflicts between each other so that they can more effectively speak back into the system and make better change for all against systemic racism? Asking honest questions is always very good. But um, now I want to clarify, I have told people, you know, hey, there are certain situations to where you do need to mind your business. Um, but when there is, is harm or trauma and people are endangered, um, if I love you, if I care about this community, that is my business. Um, but there is a difference of oppressive interaction and involvement than uh, true um, compassion, empathy, or trying to assist. Um, and so a lot of times I will ask, how can I best support? Um, do you need a mediator in this situation? Um, and sometimes people will say no um, because of systems of distrust that are justified, by the way. Um, and you have to um, you have to learn how to get over those impasses um, to where you're able to actually interact and be of service. Um, but a lot of times um, people do learn how to resolve um, certain issues themselves. Um, sometimes resolution uh, takes a long time um, but so does the journey to justice. Um, and the revolution has been going on for centuries. Um, so we just have to learn how to accept um, the process and learn how better to be part of it um, without um, trying to insert ourselves into the spaces where it is um, not beneficial. May I, uh, does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. May, may I speak from a, 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 a majority culture position as well? Um, I think one of the things that we can do when we find ourselves in the majority is to stop judging people by saying, y'all minorities. And that part. Make, <laughs> and, <laughs> had to examine the role of majority culture in pitting minorities against each other and in vying for the crumbs of acceptance that are out there, which can then cause more tension in communities of color. And that is something that we can be doing um, in addition to minding our own business. I couldn't have put that any better. Plus you will always have the the privilege of and the stance of being um, in a position of, of power or having privilege that I never will. Um, I am just very uh, fortunate that uh, friends like both of you use that privilege um, in ways um, that helps push the needle. Um, you have been very intentional in becoming um, allies. You both have been accomplices um, and you are very honest about your privilege and very um, deliberate in using that in the best way possible, um, which means that you have been very, very um, genuine um, and um, very genuine um, and have made me very grateful 
to be amongst um, so many people um, that are doing the same. So I'll, I'll, I'll say it. Most people are like, Sheree, you hate white people. And you say all white people are racist. Well, because you were born into um, a culture um, that is the power hierarchy is of race. Um, all white people are racist, um, but racism is not a deal breaker. If it was, I wouldn't have any white friends. Um, racism is just, um, it's a factor. Um, not all white people are white supremacists. Um, and I think we, we attach being racist um, to very negative connotations um, when we are, when, and when we make the accusation of this is racism, it really is part of the system of white supremacy and hate and um, intentional violence. Um, and even when it's unintentional, it's still violence. Um, and so we also have to um, explain the difference and be able to acknowledge the difference. Um, most of my white friends will say, I know that I am racist. I work in being a, a being non-racist or anti-racist, and it is um, an expectation and a demand for my friends and my own communities. And I'm like, go ahead with your bad self. <laughs> I'm rooting for you. Um, but I also hold myself accountable um, in trying to remember um, that some people don't always understand the difference. Now, it's still not my job to teach it to you, but if I see you struggling, I probably will so that we can get beyond that. But I also want to say that wasn't a call for me to increase the vast number of, of white people who want to be my friends. <laughs> I, I speak personally when I say that your level of graciousness and patience is about second to none. Yep. Um, and related to the energy that you expend in this area, I want to follow up with that question about quality of life. How do you choose which projects to devote your time and energy to at any given time? And how do you make room for rest Sabbath uh, in the midst of that? So um, early off, one of my first statements was, is that I have the inability to say no. Um, no, you know, wholeheartedly um, that that has been a struggle. And so um, me choose, it's not really a choice. Um, when there is plight, um, when there is travail, um, and when people are going through things, um, sorry, my phone was ringing. Uh, when people are going through things, my heart, I am truly altruistic um, and I'm a nurturer um, and a mom. And so I want to be a fixer, um, but I've learned how to um, prioritize. Um, I have a great support system and real friends and family who love me enough to say, hey, one, um, we can handle this. Um, I have sisters um, and brothers who say, um, you are, you haven't rested um, and you are doing very strange things and becoming quite uncouth. Be quiet and go to sleep. Um, um, go sit down, drink some water. Um, and I've had people who say, um, Tree, you are worthy of love. You are worthy of moments to where people are able to offer kindness and nurturing to you. Um, and I had a very dear friend tell me um, just a couple of days ago, um, one of the reasons why I struggle is because of my, my lack of trust in their love for me. And they said, I get it because I know how much trauma you have dealt with. And so let's work on 
you being able to identify uh, when is authentic, when it is real, um, and we can better uh, protect you while you are trying to protect everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and these are things that I am just now learning here at 47 years of age. Um, and my children, my children teach me and enlighten me. Um, and yes, they are the type of children who don't um, thank me for dinner if they don't like the way it tastes. Um, I have one that's a little bit more diplomatic and will say, um, I don't have a large appetite tonight. Um, and then I have one that will say, did you forget something in the recipe? Did you have a recipe? Um, and, and please do not tor torture us by making this again. Um, <laughs> and so that also having that realness um, adds to the quality of my life. Um, and I have been blessed with, um, and I understand this is a privilege. There's so many people that don't have health care, that don't have access uh, to mental health care. Um, I'm just lucky that I have a lot of friends um, who work in the mental health, um, <laughs> mental health care world. Um, friends who are physicians that say, hey, this shouldn't be happening and learn to listen to your body. Um, people who are um, naturalists and people who are nutritionists to say, you know, if you eat at least twice a day, your body will appreciate it um, and you'll get to be here longer. Um, and if you drink water, um, then you don't have to worry about also having um, one or two glasses of sweet tea um, during the week or whatever it is. Um, and people also say, um, that I deserve to have um, moments of joy and things that I enjoy. Um, and I actually have people who are trying to convince me to go on something called a vacation. Um, um, that I, I guess I could throw out, um, you know, Cash App and PayPal and say, hey, if you want me to go, help me with that. But I have those type of systems um, that helps with my quality of life. Um, and it, I am very prayerful that each person, because every living being deserves to have that same um, system of support. Um, and I hope that if they don't, um, that the broader community and those around them will be very intentional in making sure that they know that they also are worthy of loved. Um, I think that is the best and the highest form of ministry um, and care and love and grace um, and charity that anyone could do. And that does not matter what faith system you assign to. Um, that just kind of makes us, um, I think that's what makes um, you really cool if that's what you practice. Amen and amen. That's probably the most beautiful and powerful statement that you could make to encourage us in our work. Um, what I personally heard was in my membership in the white community, we need to be working to learn ourselves, not expect people to teach us. And we should be working for that day that like you, others who have dealt with oppression and systemic racism and marginalization and harm can not only feel equity and the life that they can have, but that support, that level of personal human support because they're valued and recognized exactly the way they are. That's I'm, real liberation work. I'm so thankful for you and I'm thankful for you, Rabbi. That you would that you would both be in this conversation. Any final words, and then we're we're out. I always say, if we can have accountability, transparency, collective power, um, with a lot of grace and love, um, then we will resolve a lot of the issues that corrupt humanity as a whole, um, and then we will treat Mother Earth 
which embraces us all and provides us with everything that we need, um, we won't. We we will. We will not continue to abuse her. And thank you for. I want to uh, give a, a shout out and a thanks to all of those that share um, and stand in community with me um, on a daily basis. You two included. I love you for real. Love you too. I hope you know we both love you too. Um, Black Lives Matter. And I'm on. And I would like to say to all of our uh, viewers who've been with us tonight, not only thank you very much, but you can support the amazing work of this amazing soul in a lot of ways. I know there have been a lot of very public calls to use our capital to support those businesses that are black owned, that are female owned, that are Asian owned, that are um, trans owned, that are LGBT owned in general, um, all sorts of calls. But as a reminder, to please consider some of your charitable giving to stay in the community, to the work of local activists uh, and local action organizations like Black Lives Matter Oklahoma, like the Women's March of Oklahoma, like all of the other organizations that uh, Reverend Dickerson um, uh, blesses with her time. Also like that of the Interfaith Alliance. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and good night. Good night, Ashe, beloveds. <laughs>